The world and architecture as we see it. Everything links to the Vitruvian virtues of architecture. Utilitas, firmitas, venutas, and otherwise known as utility. Is it functional? Firmness? Will it stand? And delight? Is it attractive? Does it make me feel some sort of inner peace about the world and my surroundings? Now these notions of how we look at architecture were introduced by Roman architect and writer Vitruvius in his 10 books of architecture dedicated to the Roman Empire a really long time ago. According to Vitruvius, architecture is an imitation of nature. As birds and bees built their nests, so humans constructed houses from natural materials that protected them from the weather. It is our opinion that architecture throughout the ages, before Vitruvius and after, addresses these principles differently based on cultural ideals and economic means. So we will start in Egypt. Now the most famous architecture from Egypt is the Pyramid of Giza. Egypt was run by a pharaoh who claimed that he was God. It was also an extremely powerful and wealthy kingdom. Because of their cultural ideals about the, the pharaoh, most of their architecture reflected their beliefs. The all-seeing pyramid that held the dare of dead pharaoh and all of his belongings, their wealth also played a part in this as they had the means to create something that met the principles that Vitruvius laid out. Is it functional? Yes. Is it a booby-trapped labyrinth that holds our dead pharaoh and all of his riches and belongings? Will it stand? Well, it has been how many years since the pyramids were built and they haven't fallen? Is it beautiful to behold? It's one of the seven wonders of the world, is it not? Now we will go to Rome, one of the world's largest empires. They had power and gobs of money in which the government chose to spend on city planning, public and private buildings, as well as religious buildings. With the taxes they received, the ruling class were able to build sturdy buildings that were intricately decorated and in some cases have continued to be in use for hundreds of years. Quick name drop, the Acropolis, the Pantheon, and the Basilica. Despite the collapse of the Roman Empire, their style of architecture stays with the Western world for an extremely long time. Perhaps it was the Romans who truly understood what it meant to build a quality building. So now we head on to look at cathedrals. The church also had a huge income and had overwhelming power and influence on the medieval culture. They borrowed from the Roman-style basilica and covered every surface of their building with stories and the theological allegories to control the faithful public. During this time, the church stressed commodity and delight over firmness, and many of the medieval cathedrals have had to endure some major construction to keep from falling down. During and after the Enlightenment, we begin to see people writing down rules for architecture. The Renaissance countered the Gothic thought and refocused their style of building back to classical architecture. It's all about precision, balance, and symmetry. We see that in many of the chateaus that were built during the Renaissance. People with money being able to afford the cost of building structures that were useful, structurally sound, and beautiful. During the Baroque time period, we see another shift in the focus as buildings become more dramatic. The men holding the purse strings could afford a little more drama and insisted upon showing off their wealth by focusing heavily on structure and the beauty of the object. However, much of the things that were built during the Baroque time period didn't serve much of a function to the public other than displaying the huge disparity between the rich and the poor. Then we introduced trade into the whole mix. The world opened up and the Western world was introduced to new ideas, rules, and cultures. Colonization spread and people became more and more infatuated with the idea of identity. In the new world, the colonists began their first steps towards breaking away from Britain. They began re-exploring Greco-Roman architecture and introduced that powerful style into many of their leading economic industries, the plantations. Here we have a similar thing that happens, where wealth once again is able to afford commodity, firmness, and delight. The next big event to change architecture and design was the Industrial Revolution. During this time period, many different expressions of design based on the new world of machines and materials emerge. People begin pushing the boundaries of classical design and focus their building on becoming the biggest and the best building to prove their forward thinking and abilities. This competition between designers and countries allowed for a lot of carelessness in design, and here we can see commodity falling to firmness, firmness falling to delight, and delight falling to commodity, and so on and so forth, in a domino-like fashion. We see a lot of temporary buildings being built of glass and cast iron. 
There are many different revivals during the 1800s, Gothic revivals, Greco-Roman revival, and the introduction of ancient Eastern design and surface motif into public design. There is a huge debate among architects as to which style has the most dominant voice in the Western world. It's a tug of war between a house being a machine and a house being a spiritual dwelling. Bauhaus versus Art Nouveau, the evil machine versus arts and crafts. In the modern world, again, we see the struggle between embracing and emphasizing commodity, firmness, and delight. Within the modern design mentality, people began to realize that comfort is not a function of beauty, utility doesn't necessarily mean a building is beautiful, and form doesn't have anything to do with function. So because of this dilemma, we see buildings by Frank Gehry that are absolutely ridiculous. They have no link to any former architectural style and have more in common with a bought up piece of paper rather than the traditional form wall building. The design thought of the 21st century is nothing more than a circuitous motion of revisited failures and idealistic impossibilities. The things we thought worked no longer work for a society that is trying to redeem its crimes against the environment and the challenges for architects and designers today is to not only meet the standards of commodity, firmness, and delight, but also sustainability, which adds to a greater cost to the budget for building.